Namaskar, hello and a very warm welcome viewers. You're watching Committee Report with your host Kriti Mishra. Today we'll take a closer look at the report of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs on India and Bilateral Investment Treaties. Bilateral Investment Treaty is an agreement for recording protection to investments by nationals and companies of one state in another state. International investment agreements, which include bilateral investment treaties and investment chapters of trade and economic agreements, provide for a reciprocal commitment to protect the private foreign investments in each other's countries. In the last few decades, bilateral investment treaties have become an integral part of international investment relations. Their existence has a great impact in influencing formulation of international public policy. India's tryst with bilateral investment treaties started in 1994 when it signed its first such treaty with the United Kingdom. It subsequently went on to sign it with more than 80 countries. These treaties were largely negotiated on the basis of the Indian Model BIT text of 1993. India revised its Model BIT text in 2050. And before we commence our discussion, Here's a detailed report for our viewers on key observations and recommendations of the Committee on External Affairs. Take a look. The Standing Committee on External Affairs submitted its report on the subject India and Bilateral Investment Treaties on September 10, 2021. Bilateral investment treaties are reciprocal agreements between two countries to promote and protect foreign private investments. India revised its model BIT text in 2015. The committee observed that since then, India has signed new bilateral treaties, investment agreements with only four countries, and is negotiating with 37 countries or blocs, and terminated its older BITs with 77 countries. The parliamentary panel on external affairs noted that BITs have the potential to attract foreign direct investment by providing prospective investors with a high degree of confidence in their investments. It recommended signing new BITs with countries with which India had such treaties in the past and early completion of treaty negotiations by the Ministry of External Affairs in coordination with other ministries and departments. BITs generally provide a mechanism for settling disputes between investors and the country of investment. The most preferred mode of settling such disputes is arbitration where parties agree to have their dispute decided by a neutral person instead of going to the court. The committee noted that so far, there have been 37 notices of dispute or letters intending to raise a dispute against India under various BITs. To avoid such losses in the future, the committee recommended timely settlement of investment disputes through pre-arbitration consultation or negotiations. The committee also noted that negotiations with the USA on BIT are being held since 2009 and desired that process of negotiations should be started and concluded early so as to contribute towards increasing investment in priority sectors and high technology manufacturing. The committee noted that while the model BIT 2015 is an improvement over the older BITs, there is still scope for fine-tuning some of its provisions. And for deeper insights on the bilateral investment treaties and on the key recommendations of the committee, I'm joined by an illustrious panel of guests. Joining us through virtual platform, Mr. P.P. Chaudhry, Chairman, Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs. Mr. Damu Ravi, Secretary ER, Ministry of External Affairs. Professor Swarn Singh, Chairperson, Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament, JNU. And Mr. Chaudhry, let me begin the program with you. And before we get into the specifics, take us through the broad highlights of the report presented by the External Affairs Committee on India and Bilateral Investment Treaties. This is basically this, uh, uh, this first time this we have entered into uh, this bilateral investment treaty uh, post-1991 uh, reform in 1994. And no doubt the bilateral investment treaty was signed with 84 countries, but was enforced not with all the countries. And for such a long period, we never revisited with respect to those provisions of the treaty, with respect to the definition of the investors, definition of the investment. 
and on account of this large number of cases arose and uh, almost 37 cases were of the arbitrations arose out of those because this words the definition was uh, loosely drafted and those were ambiguous and on account of that the cases were arose and the first time in 2015 this new model of bilateral investment treaty was uh, uh, this uh, the earlier notice of termination was given and new treaty came into force and these bilateral investment treaties are no doubt uh, very very important for uh, this uh, inviting this uh, investment fdis and all this in case where the protection uh, of the investment is not there then uh, this uh, investor is not inclined to invest but that that can't be the sole factor but this is one of the very important factor so even even in absence of this we we have received the uh, this uh, foreign direct investment and the investment in our country but at the same times there are other factors like infrastructures manpower and uh, ease of doing business the productivity and this uh, market there are so many other factors which are very very crucial but at the same time the whether the investment by the bilateral treaty that the investment is secure and safe so now that the india realized that we have to strike a fine balance between the regulation by the government and at the same time the protection of the investment so both the things have been taken together now this model is uh, no doubt certainly improvement uh, on the earlier model but it needs revisiting time to time and best internal practices are required to be introduced in this bilateral investment treaty and i think the coordination between Uh, this department of legal affairs ministry of external affairs Depart department of economic affairs and the other department are required to be taken into consideration but the investment is not limited on only to the this uh, production but it is also related to goods and services so no doubt uh, some of the uh, we are also having the wider level apart from the investment uh, this uh, bilateral investment treaty we are also having fta the this uh, and uh, this uh, ca ca uh, the comprehensive yes. economic uh, cooperation agreement comprehensive economic partnership agreement and these are part as to the part of the bilateral investment treaty absolutely so, sir so I you made a very important point about this. ftas and also bilateral investment treaties to get an understanding mr ravi to set the tone and tenor of the discussion help us understand the difference between bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements well um uh, thank you very much uh, i'm really honored to be on this panel uh, with the distinguished uh, panelists here the honorable member of parliament and professor sun singh but let me tell you in the context of the bilateral ftas you know while most bilateral ftas uh, are sometimes stand alone but there are also chapters relating to investment treaties and these investment uh, treaties also have provisions uh, that have a lingering effect you know and and these are there are sunset clauses which go on for Uh, 10 to 15 years, even though you might terminate the uh, investment treaty. So we have to make a distinguish uh, distinction between these two. Uh, when you do an investment treaty standalone, or when you do an investment chapter under an FTA. So this is uh, where uh, we have to be very clear, so carefully navigate when you negotiate uh, chapters uh, differently. So India has entered into um, several years, uh, about 20 of them uh, in the last two decades. Uh, some of them have invested chapters investment chapters but a lot of them are standalone but you see in since uh, the 1994 uh, bit text uh, as the honorable member of parliament has already mentioned that we have concluded more than 80 uh, fta uh, uh, investment treaties uh, and 74 of them are uh, enforcement enforced but there is now a move to uh, uh, to to terminate them because you have a new uh, bit under the 2015 model text Uh, where the provisions have changed, so the navigating this complex uh, process is one of the ministerial consultations on a regular basis, involving Ministry of External Affairs, Department of Economic Affairs, and the Department of Legal Affairs. Thank you. All right, uh, Professor Singh, coming to you now. Investment arbitration requires lawyers and judges who possess the expertise and experience at international forums. Now, the committee noted that India lacks inadequate number. of persons who have the required expertise and experience in this domain how do we address 
this critical problem. Thank you, Kriti. Uh, uh, I'm happy to join this uh, very interesting uh, program on BIT. And first thing I think uh, I need to underline is why are we discussing this? You would notice that last year we celebrated the fact that India received for 2020-21 record number of uh, almost $82 billion of investments. This has never happened before. Uh, and moreover, it was said that in you know, 20 years of this century, where we have received about $764 billion of foreign direct investment, last seven years itself received $440 billion of yeah. investments. So foreign direct investment and India as a destination is becoming very significant component for India's policymakers, but also for global investors. That obviously throws up not just several new opportunities, but also several new challenges. Now, for instance, computer, hardware, software have emerged as the most preferred sector, receiving almost 19% of foreign direct investment, followed by services at 15%, and so on, telecommunications and infrastructure, for example, 7%. So it's a change of the entire context, which is leading to a whole set of uh, policy reforms. Uh, India's uh, ease of doing business, for example, have uh, really improved over the last several years. India has done several other, for example, uh, the decision of uh, no retroactive taxation. Uh, several other such decisions of both initiatives and creating agencies has led to the fact that a model, you know, BIT that was created in 2015, uh, today needs to be revised. And that is where the committee and I'm happy to have uh, the chair himself uh, participating in this discussion today. And I'm sure he can go into what has led to these uh, you know, groundbreaking new recommendations. Uh, is to say we need to achieve certain efficiency in achieving BITs, but also make it detailed and exhaustive so that we don't you know, end, end up again into dispute resolution issues that we have faced over a period of time. We have had certain uh, dispute, uh, disputes happening. Now come to your question, uh, Kriti, which you mentioned why it is that we need to create a pool uh, of uh, you know, both lawyers and judges with enormous expertise and experience in uh, arbitration at the global level. India has already signed, ME has signed an agreement with Permanent Court of Arbitration that we could do uh, a certain amount of arbitration within India itself. So it's in the new context here where the committee, I understand, is recommending to create that important pool so that India potentially can not just deal with its own arbitration, but emerge perhaps regional you know, hub for arbitration uh, for several neighboring countries or other countries could also use our, 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 our sort of expertise in that sense. So fundamentally, Kriti, because the context is changing rapidly is why there is a need to sort of revisit and review the model that we have had of 2015 and when committees reviewing that model, committees also recommending several other initiatives and things that India needs to do to fine tune, streamline, and sort of take best benefit of this India becoming a you know, huge attraction for, for global investors. Of course, India is also now beginning to be an important investor abroad. That's a separate story. Absolutely. So, so you're saying that we have to develop our country into hub of international arbitration. Let me take that to the chairperson of this committee. Mr. Chaudhary, the committee noted that the new Delhi International Arbitration Centre has been established. The committee desires that this centre should be promoted and strengthened. But how do we ensure that India becomes a world-class arbitration centre for dispute resolution? Yes, this initially, you know that uh, we were having the um, interstate, uh, this international centre for alternate uh, dispute resolution and this uh, state of the art this infrastructure we have created in our country in New Delhi. But for the last so many years, it, uh, not, it, it did not attract uh, uh, such a this arbitration uh, dispute here. And now this, this act is there, New Delhi International Arbitration Center. This, uh, uh, this, that will be regulated by that on the basis of that uh, law passed by the parliament. But certainly it can uh, act as a catalyst for international arbitration. For that purpose, not only the infrastructure, but we also need the human resources in respect to the lawyers, in respect to the arbitrators. So a atmosphere is required to be created in our country. Therefore, we, we, this, this, this institution is required to be promoted. And now this the reference was also made by the professor with respect to the signing of the agreement with permanent court of arbitration. 
that will certainly help us but at the same time we have to create the we have created the world class infrastructure that is one thing that is one of the requirement but at the same time we are required to create the world class arbitrator and the world class lawyers and law firms who can so for that purpose this either the dedicated courses should be there in the national law university for that purpose otherwise because we are our the law this uh, curriculum it basically is not of such a nature which which uh, uh, this uh, meet the requirement of these things so we can't develop the uh, at, after passing the law uh, candidate uh, is passing the law schools we can create from the bottom at the ground level so at the in the university itself we can have a, um, a dedicated department for this purpose because in coming here because we see that goods and services as well as uh, this larger investment can be there the entire globe can be one market and the large number of arbitration issues can be there and now india is also realizing that we must have also the mediation therefore this mediation and arbitration is will be the crucial for settlement of the dispute therefore we have to this is the reason that the committee realized that apart from the infrastructure world class state of the art of the infrastructure this is available in india but at the same time we must have this uh, human resources like the lawyers law firm and at the same time judges to deal with these cases and we must a, a message should be uh, given to the global message should be there that we are having uh, these type of expertise and there is i don't think there is a dearth of expertise but only the thing that we have to select this area vigorously and we have to work in this direction All right. So as you're saying that there's no dearth of expertise, it's just that we need to develop it further. But Mr. Ravi, talking about another important observation and recommendation of the committee, the committee notes that Model BIT 2015 attempts to create a balance between the government's right to regulate and investment protection. The committee also desires that an in-depth study may be made for the working and outcome of such treaties adopted by advanced countries and their best practices and provisions. may be incorporated in the indian model bit so what's the way ahead for further fine tuning our bit text thank you very much uh, kriti uh, i think first we have to understand that uh, any investment treaty has to be dynamic and dynamic to the changing circumstances international situation and the the global developments that are there now if you see that 2015 uh, text was um, a big improvement over the 1994 text that the provisions are uh, the isds was a major problem for us the uh, the investor state dispute settlement provision which where a uh, companies somewhat non serious trying to take the state to a dispute so this was a very draconian provision that was there and uh, so that 2015 text try to remove that and uh, bring in provisions that are able to balance the national interest and the uh, the investor interest and the investor protection so at the end of the day we have to understand that the any investment that comes into india uh, in our country we have to see that it serves the national purpose as well it should create a win win situation both for the investor and for the country in terms of economic activity revenue generation uh, employment generation and the dynamism in the economic uh, growth it has to play a major role and that's important so in that context uh, the model bit of 2015 is an improvement Uh, but i believe there is a lot of scope for further improvement because we have to understand the nature of investment that coming into the country are very different now yes. it's not just fdi the foreign direct investment but you're also seeing a, a large number of quantum of the the portfolio investment there are a lot of merger and acquisitions that are happening uh, in the country so you have to be very dynamic in the way you drive this so very rightly said you know we need to also study the practices elsewhere in uh, in the world and how they are serving those countries and what best we can incorporate but at the end of the day we have to see that whether an investment treaty or a bilateral investment or even a trilateral investment would be serving our country first or not that's something we have to keep in mind uh, and keeping that in view any changes are welcome thank you all right so as you're saying that we have to adopt a very very dynamic approach but professor yeah. singh given how india is currently focused on pulling in investments and global value chains especially during the covid and the post covid world order how important would be these treaties as an instrument 
I think when you're uh, looking at uh, reviewing and revising for the next model of BITs, uh, there are things that are uh, in debate, not just in India, but globally, there is a discussion on such issues. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, supply chains. Pandemic has seen world debating about how to reorganize supply chains that have become far too China-centric. Yes. So now one of the important issues that the new model must look at, and this is very significant as part of Make in India as Atmanirvar Bharat debate, that you know, VIT must ensure that what kind of and what percentage of components in that supply chain would be led by domestic production, domestic services, domestic contributions to the supply chain or value chains. And that's going to be a very significant part of the next model of BIT. Likewise, I think there is a debate around the world now that all these BITs fundamentally look at an agreement between the state and the corporate investor, and therefore talks about promoting and protecting investments, uh, which of course clearly leaves out. I was happy to see Damu Ravi, Mr. Damu Ravi mentioning about national interests now, national interest is not limited to state interest simply. And therefore, there's a whole debate among civil society whether the BITs should also take into consideration of not just protecting and promoting investors and corporate interests, but also looking at environmental concerns, looking at labor rights, looking at several other cultural and social provisions that sometimes become significant uh, depending on which sector one is uh, focusing on in terms of these investments. And another thing is to stretch that whole space of arbitration, create stages where before it goes as far as into a formal arbitration, create stages of pre-arbitration consultations, yes. pre-arbitration negotiations, where you have this leeway of resolving a large number of issues before making them rigid and sort of going to a third party, uh, which makes it difficult. And of course, in third party arbitration, again, there are institutions which state creates, and then there are also uh, individuals, which parties to dispute could, could come together and choose sometime an individual deciding arbitration between them. State can definitely emphasize on building institution. And that is where I think Mr. Chaudhary's report is uh, focusing on how to strengthen both the pool of people who will deliver these arbitration or pre-arbitration negotiations and con consultations to resolve some of these disputes but also how to strengthen institutions potentially to go back to the ambition of making Indian hub and hub of arbitration, but fundamentally avoiding situations where you have to go to arbitration in case of investments from other countries. All right. So there should be no ambiguity. And also you mentioned about the sectors. Let me take that question to the chair of the committee. Mr. Chaudhary, the committee notes that BITs must be selectively in identified priority sectors. Sir, what could be those sectors? The sectors are required to be selected uh, by the, this close cooperation of the de Department of Economic Affairs, Department of the Legal Affairs, Department of the, this Ministry of Ethical Affairs, as well as the this uh, the concerned department, uh, whose uh, this particular sector is related. So it is we can't make the stereotype. So it is basically it is a dynamic, basic based on the the global market and so many issues. So those issues are to be selected on, on the basis of those. The FTA is required to be executed, this other agreement and bilateral investment treaty, and that is to be looked in accordance with those sectors. So the sectors can't be specified by the committee. Therefore, we have made it open for the government to decide those sectors. After this, uh, this cooperation, close cooperation with the various departments who are concerned in this connection. All right, let me give the last word to Mr. Ravi. Mr. Ravi, as the chair is saying, that these sectors have to be identified after close coordination between different ministries and departments. What's the way ahead, sir? Well, uh, definitely. I think uh, uh, the way Indian economy is going, uh, there's varied interest um, uh, to make investments work. Okay, investments in areas where I believe in a manufacturing sector is very, very important for us. So that's where we need to look at the green investments coming in, the FDIs in manufacturing, the PLI scheme, for example. The product link incentive is a very, very, very strong uh, attraction for uh, foreign investments to come into India. And there are various sectors mapped out there. But I think, you know, when we link the investment to uh, the employment generation, it would make immense sense. I think uh, then again, uh, you know, the interministerial group will look into this, uh, the sectors that would be uh, useful. Uh, they're generating employment, they're creating economic value for the country. Uh, and that's a process. 
uh, and I would definitely see that uh, in the manufacturing sector is a great um, uh, opportunity. And MEA will continue to play a, a positive role in, uh, in driving this uh, initiative uh, in, in, as a goal of, goal of government of India. Thank you. Absolutely, Mr. Ravi, and I'm sure the recommendations of the committee would be extremely instrumental to Ministry of External Affairs as well as other departments. So the committee provided these valuable inputs after several meetings with all stakeholders spanning over several days. Here's a report. The committee selected the subject India and Bilateral Investment Treaties for detailed examination during the year 2020-2021. The committee held briefings and took oral evidences of the representatives of the Ministries of External Affairs, Finance, Law and Justice and Commerce and Industry. The committee sought views of several experts. The report was considered and adopted by the committee at the sitting held on 11th August 2021. And with that, it's a wrap on the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Chaudhary, Mr. Ravi and Professor Singh. Next week, we'll return with key highlights of another parliamentary committee report. Till then, take care and stay safe and also stay tuned to Sunset TV. Namaskar.